next medley of hymns, we begin with the solid rock. And 
the third verse. When By grace all submission shall be thy supply. my rock, my shield, my fortress. He's my deliverer, my stream. The courts of death, they were surrounding me. Heard my cry for help. He is my refuge. My deliverer so strong. The snares of death, they were confronting me. But he heard my prayer. So I'll stand in trust. I'll stand in faith. I will not. I'll stand in trust, I'll stand in faith, I will not be shaken. He is my rock, my shield, my fortress, he's my salvation and my strength. The courts of death, they were surrounding me, but he heard my cry for help. So I'll stand in trust, I'll stand in faith, I will not be shaken. I'll stand in trust. I'll stand in faith, I will not be shaken. Our God will not be moved, our God will never change, our God will reign I'll stand in trust, I'll stand in faith, I will not be shaken. I'll stand in trust, I'll stand in faith, oh, I will not be shaken. Thank you. 
Let's give Steve a hand. That's great. <clears throat> very, very nice. Uh, again, my name is Rick Bysadecki. Some of you are wondering, that, that looks like a, an alphabet train wreck. It, well, it is. Uh, I tell people it's Italian, but it's really Polish. I mean, it had more mystique if it were Italian. Uh, but if I were on a bicycle and had a recce, Bysadecki. It's just really simple, okay? I'm very glad to be with you today. I uh, am the, the new associational mission strategist. I just took over for Alan Morris. Alan and his wife uh, sold everything. Sold their house. They sold everything down to the dishes in the cabinets, clothes in their drawers. Um, they even sold their, sold their drawers. Uh, they sold their cars. They sold everything and moved to the Yucatan Peninsula in Mexico to work with people to train pastors and to help reach people with the good news of Jesus. Uh, they're in language school right now. Alan and his wife are in their mid-60s. If you know them, Alan's much older than Rebecca. Yeah, I just have to make sure that gets on audio. Um, but they're in language school, and so they're in their mid-60s and starting off from scratch learning Spanish uh, to do this work. And so please remember Alan Morris and his wife Rebecca in your prayers as they do this, uh, this ministry together. Hopefully you have a Bible with you this morning. I would love for you to open up to Matthew chapter 7, beginning in verse 24. Matthew chapter 7, beginning in verse 24. And I'm reading from the Committed Southern Baptist Bible, the Christian Standard. If anybody has one of those. I'm reading from chapter 7, beginning in verse 24. And... This is what it says. Therefore, anyone who hears these words of mine and acts on them will be like a wise man who built his house on the rock. The rain fell and the rivers rose and the winds blew and pounded the house, yet it did not collapse because its foundation was on the rock. But everyone who hears these words of mine and doesn't act on them will be like a foolish man who built his house on the sand. The rain fell, the rivers rose, the winds blew and pounded the house and it collapsed and it collapsed with a great crash. When Jesus had finished saying these things, the crowds were astonished at His teaching because He was teaching them like one who had authority and not like their scribes. Would you go to the Lord in prayer with me? Father, You are awesome. You are wonderful and altogether lovely. Father, this morning as we take a little time to read Your Word and to study together, Father, I pray that, that Your Holy Spirit is with us that You speak where I can't, that You do what I can't. Move people's hearts to be inclined to You. Father, this morning, I, I just want to read Your Word and point to You. And Father, I pray this morning that You allow me to take a step back and allow Christ and the cross to be seen. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Uh, I'm, I'm getting a little older, and I am getting to be one of those folks who is a Weather Channel aficionado. Anybody else? I have I have Weather Underground on my computer. I track storms on my phone. Yes, I'm one of those people. I even, for Father's Day a couple years ago, got one of those uh, weather tracking things that I can put up on the side of the house that my wife said, please put it in an inconspicuous place. And I can track wind patterns and everything. Yes, I'm one of those. I, I even... Um, after playing basketball years ago, and, and I used to be an athlete, right? <laughs> used to be. Um, I have arthritis in my knee, and I can even tell Uncle Art comes to visit me, arthritis. And uh, I can feel storms coming. I can tell my wife, I feel a storm a brewing, because I always wanted to be a pirate. Anybody else? Um, I, I can do that. When, when I was a kid, we lived in Biloxi, Mississippi. That used to be the home of the hurricane chasers for the Air Force. And as a kid, they used to print, <clears throat> this kids, this is before 
internet, okay? They used to print paper bags at the grocery store and they would do the, the long, longitude latitude of the Gulf of Mexico on the side of the grocery bag and me and my cousin would track storms as they were going through the Gulf of Mexico. Yes, I'm one of those people. I've been through hurricanes. I, I, I love great storms and, and all that kind of stuff. I watched the weather. And I, I've even been on a mission trip in Mexico and we got, we got caught up in Hurricane Dolly while we were on the mission trip. Uh, lived through Hurricane Frederick and some others. And my grandmother was still living in the house that she had lived in forever during Hurricane Katrina. Well, I want to show you this little clip, this uh, clip from CNN about one of the people that was in that storm in Hurricane Katrina. Wow, that was, it seems like forever ago. But I want you to watch this clip for how this guy dealt with a major storm. quarter mile from shore inside Harvey bruised and in obvious pain tells his amazing story of getting caught in the middle of Hurricane Katrina it's like a ocean of water came rolling in Harvey says he waited until just hours before the storm was to hit before trying to move his boat engine trouble then left him stranded and the next thing he knew Katrina had control of his boat it was slammed and hit something so hard that you were like a projectile shooting across a wheelhouse. And it knocked me down, I mean, to the deck. And I'd get up and sometimes I didn't think I was going to get up. Harvey says at one point he was able to turn the boat towards the shoreline. The wind shifted and uh, it just flipped me around and shot me right between those buildings. This home video was shot from a balcony next to where Harvey ended up. He says he was tossed around for hours as buildings around him crumbled. I'm like going over a waterfall. When the storm finally subsided, Harvey says he looked up to find himself beached on what used to be somebody's home. And that's where I sat here and had been sitting. And I got my son. He's headed down to get me. Alongside Harvey during the storm were his dogs, Coco and Lady. He says Coco, the poodle, hid in this drawer. While he says this was the worst, Harvey claims it isn't the first time he survived a storm at sea. Harvey says he went through Camille in 1969 and a typhoon in the South Pacific. Harvey says he's not sure why, but he always manages to come out alive. Well, I'm a religious man. I just think he was saving me for something worse. Can't find it. Ted Rowland, CNN, Biloxi, Mississippi. Funny how that man right there, my Uncle Harvey, uh, went through that storm. Harvey Shaw's boat ended yeah. up more than a quarter mile. It's so good, we'll watch it again. Um, my Uncle Harvey was an, was an interesting man. He... In World War II, he was in the Merchant Marines, and he was in a typhoon in the South China Sea. When Camille came in 69, he got out into the, the Gulf and, and, of course, got all up in that storm. And for Katrina, he was tossed about and came, what he told us later, is through the lobby of the Hard Rock Cafe that had just been built and was going to be open the following week there in Biloxi. Um, my grandmother was in her house. Her and my grandpa were just down the street. And the water, the highest point of the water had ever come in Biloxi, came up and their house floated down the street with my grandmother and grandfather in the attic. They had to be cut out of the roof. Um, and I can just imagine the picture of my 84-year-old grandma riding on the back of the uh, military truck as they're pulling away from what was the shambles of their house. Um, I do like storms, but, but I don't like that. I, I've... I'm the kind of person that wants to be prepared. Uh, I, I've learned that after going through difficulty. In fact, you, are you familiar with the phrase, be prepared? Um, there used to be an organization called the Boy Scouts. And the Boy Scouts used that phrase. In fact, it's the only phrase that is on the Eagle Scout uh, uh, medal. At the top of the medal, it only says those two words, be prepared. You may, may not know the history of that, but there was a guy named Robert Bowden Parker in England at the beginning of the 1900s. 
And he wanted to get young men to not just be in the military, but he wanted them to, to be you know, uh, a valuable part of the community, even as young men. And he started the scouts and started with that phrase, be prepared. And someone asked him one time, he said, what do you want them to be prepared for? And he said, well, golly, anything. And I have known Boy Scouts and Eagle Scouts through the years who are truly prepared for anything. But my encouragement for you today is I want you to be prepared. The Scriptures encourage us to be prepared for a lot of stuff. And I don't know if... I don't know if you feel it. I don't just feel it in my knee. I feel it in my bones. I feel it a little in my chest. But there's a storm coming. It may not be today. It may not be this month. It may not be this year. But the things in our culture and the things in our community tell us that things are a little upside down. The, the things that were used to be, uh, as the old preacher used to say, used to slink down the back street, now struts down Main Street. It's the things in our culture that used to be the hidden things are now up front. Our culture and our world is upside down. And I would venture to say if God does not bring judgment on the United States at some point, He owes Sodom and Gomorrah an apology. Because the way our culture is, we're upside down. And I think a storm is coming. Now, being prepared for a storm is a a good thing. The storm may not come, but I would much rather be prepared than not. For instance, how many of you in your car have a pair of jumper cables? Anybody carry jumper cables in your car? Well, why would you carry jumper cables in your car? Probably because your battery's gone out at some point and you needed them, right? Uh, At times, I have needed a gas can in my car. Uh, Where's the brother in the back talking about a a trip he took uh, in Missouri where they ran out of gas not far from the gas station. I, I I don't want to be that person. My wife's family, my wife's grandmother used to say that she was born in the Depression and she stayed depressed ever since. Amen, Romy? You know people like that? Some of those folks who went through those difficulty, hard times of the Depression, some of, for some of us, our parents or grandparents and, and that kind of thing, they went through difficulty and they prepared for it. They, had, they never threw anything away. They always had extra cans of something and they always made sure people had what they needed. I think we're at a time for that, not just in our culture, but for us personally. I think we can personally go through storms and go through difficulties and go through hard times, and so many people are blown away they're not prepared. I want to give you three things from this passage today, three things that Jesus tells us about that will help you be prepared for personal storms and maybe even storms that may come to our culture and may come to our nation in the not-too-distant future. Jesus gave us these words, and in most of your Bibles, if you have red letters, they're red letters. If you know anything about this section of Matthew, you know that this is probably the greatest sermon ever preached. This is the Sermon on the Mount. In the Gospel of Luke, it's called the Sermon on the Plain. Um, but and, And so, probably He preached the same thing someplace else, a different recording. It's slightly different. But the one we usually go to is the Sermon on the Mount. It's chapter 5-7 to in in, uh, Matthew. And Jesus gives these things and and they're life-changing, right? If people today were to to read these things and actually do it, it would change everything for them. The thing I want you to understand this morning is that these things that Jesus said and the Scriptures Genesis to maps, sometimes I think concordance gets in there too, from the beginning to the end, This inerrant, infallible, inspired Word, everything we need for life and godliness is in here. It doesn't tell you how to use the internet, but it does tell you how to act when you're on the internet. Right? Um, For us, if we're going to be prepared, if we're going to be prepared for whatever storm comes along, we need to be prepared, first of all, with a solid foundation. Watch what Jesus says in this passage. He says, for everyone who hears these words of mine and acts on them, or does them, will be like a wise man who built his house on a rock. I don't live too far from here. I live uh, just before you get to Cartersville. And there's a rock quarry across the highway from my neighborhood. When they were doing my house, they had to do all this bulldozer work and demolition work. And basically, under my house is this huge slab of granite. That thing ain't going nowhere, right? It's solid. Jesus is talking about a house built on the rock. 
He's, he makes this, this thing, this, it, it's solid. It's a firm foundation. How many of you used to go to the beach with your kids or grandkids or you and build a little sandcastle? I've done that. I didn't do it like other people. I usually brought a trowel, a couple shovels, two five-gallon buckets, and some other stuff. Because when I built my sandcastle, man, I was making... You guys are looking at me real funny this morning. All right. I, I wanted to make it good. So we're digging and shoveling. We're about three feet deep in this trench around the, the castle we had just built. And these people down the beach are building theirs. And it's a paltry looking little sandcastle. Right? We spent hours on that thing. My boys, we put shells up on top of the, the turrets on the side. I mean, it was, it was on until the tide came in. And when the tide came in, my castle fell just as fast as that paltry excuse for a castle those people did next to us. It was gone. Have you ever been in one of those situations where life's difficulties come along and you weren't ready for it and it wiped you out? There are some people in this area that remember what happened in 2008. They remember when the housing market sort of crashed. I know builder after builder and, and all kinds of people who lost a lot of money. I, I, I've seen it. They weren't ready for it, many of them, and some of them lost everything. Jesus is saying, if you do what I tell you, your life is going to be like a person who's built their house on a rock. Okay, it, it, It's not going to be that thing that, that, that falters with the sand. This is solid. Basically, I, I, have a, I have a statement for discipleship. You guys might want to write this down. This is hard. Okay, Here's... Here's my statement for discipleship based on what G Jesus said right there. Ready? Read the Bible. Do what it says. Drop the mic. That's it. Read the Bible. Do what it says. Jesus says right here, He says, if you will just do my words and do what I tell you, your life will be like a, it's on a solid rock. It's like uh, James, the brother of Jesus in the James chapter 1 says, you need to be doers of the Word, not hearers only. And what are you saying? Deceiving yourselves. We can all deceive ourselves into a lot of stuff. I come to church. I'm a good person. Or what we say in the South is, well, I'm a good person. Give people shirt off my back. I ain't killed nobody. <laughs> That's what we say. But, but are we following the words of Jesus? Are we actually doing what He says? If our culture would just pay attention to the Sermon on the Mount at a bare minimum. I mean, think of the Sermon on the Mount. Chapter 5, 6, and 7, right? Chapter 5, you start off with the Beatitudes. It, it says, hey, blessed, blessed or blessed are these people who do these things. He says that you ought to be salt and light. That they see your good deeds and glorify your Father in heaven. Then Jesus says, hey, wait, I didn't come to do away with the law and the prophets. I came to fulfill it. And then he goes into this exposition of all this stuff that says, hey, you know that it's said, it's written, but I say to you, Jesus all of a sudden changed it from external rules to a, a passionate heart. He said, I say to you, uh, in, in chapter 5, there's those six sections there, I say to you, don't, you know, it's written, don't murder. But I say, don't hate your brother. It's written, don't commit adultery, but I say to you, don't have lust in your heart. It's written, uh, Jesus, uh, Jesus says, it's written that God hates divorce. How many of you have been married and wanted to be divorced? If, you're, if not, you're probably lying at some point. Marriage is tough. People want to quit in it. And many of us do because it gets hard and difficult. And the, and the Scriptures say, don't do it. Stick in there. What a hard thing for us to follow. It says, uh, I say to you, don't bear false witness. But Jesus said, hey, be a per more than not telling a lie, be a man or woman of your word. It says, it's written, for an eye for an eye, a tooth for a tooth. That's proportional stuff. But Jesus said, no, if somebody asks you to go a mile, give them two. If he asks for this thing, give, give them double. Imagine if we had people in our culture do that. Here's one. You've seen it written, love your neighbor. Isn't that great? Some of us have up this side, oh, love your neighbor. We just need to love our neighbors, right? Jesus said, well, that's easy for pagans, but what about loving those who are your enemies? 
Any pagan can love those who love them, but Jesus said, what about you love your enemies and pray for those who despitefully use you? Gosh, why can't we use this in politics today? Love your enemies. Chapter 6, he says how you ought to give, how you ought to pray, the Lord's Prayer, how you ought to fast, all those things done in secret. He says, if you got stuff, don't let your stuff have you. Right? He says, lay up treasures in heaven. So if you got stuff, don't lean on your stuff. Don't worship your stuff. The next section says, if you don't have stuff, don't be anxious about it. For God clothes the birds of the air and the grass of the fields. He's got you covered. He says, seek Him first and He'll add all these things to you. Man, chapter 6, a lot of stuff. You get to chapter 7, it says, the, the American Bible verse, judge not lest ye be judged. Right? Isn't that the American Bible verse? But what does it really mean? Hey, get your stuff straight before you start have, having standards for other people. How about, how about we do that? says when you're seeking God, keep on asking, keep on seeking, keep on knocking. And then he gives uh, three sets of two. He says there's two ways. There's a narrow way and the wide way. There's two ways. He says there's two fruit. The good fruit and the bad fruit. And then he comes down to what we're talking about. There are two foundations. Folks, if you take the Sermon on the Mount from the beginning of chapter 5 to all the way to chapter 7, and you try to live that, talk about life change. Talk about cultural transformation. That if you and I can actually love our enemies, if we do the things in secret we ought to do, that our hearts transform from the inside out, and that we are poor in spirit and humble. You can't build buildings big enough that men and women, boys and girls, want to come to know Jesus. Because there's something different about those folks. Ladies and gentlemen, if we're going to be prepared for a storm, Jesus is saying, you need to start off with a good foundation. Your foundation doesn't need to be, I'm a good person, I do good things. It needs to be, I am all in with Jesus and I'm willing to do anything that He says. If you look in your life, can it be said that you are a Jesus kind of person? Can you? There's some of us that we have, we're getting a little older. And some of us are getting a little sour. And there have been some churches that I've been in, some of us are getting a little older and a little sour, look like we've been dipped in pickle juice. Because we get a little on the outside. And who wants that? There was a lady in my church when I pastored in North Carolina. The older she got, the sweeter she got. And she, you could tell that that lady had been with Jesus every day. Because she acted like it. Well, what made the difference? Her foundation, when difficulty in life came, she rolled with it. Why? Because she wasn't like a person who built her house on the sand that fell apart. She was the person who built her house on the rock. She read what Jesus said. She did what He said. Life circumstances are going to come against you. And Jesus said, the rain fell, the rivers rose, the winds blew, and pounded that house. You ever had your house pounded? I've had my head pounded. I've been in situations so tough, I quit and give up and die. Anybody been there? And it's not just a long, long ago memory. This is, this is stuff. Have you lived through difficulty? It's no fun. But I want to tell you, I built my house on the rock and when difficulty came and the rivers rose and the winds blew against my house, it did not fall because my foundation was on Jesus and not on how smart I am or the amount of people that I know or what I had in the bank. I had a firm foundation. My first question to you this morning is on what is your house of your life built? On what is your foundation? Do you have a solid foundation? The second thing I want us to see this morning is not just our foundation, but are you building with quality materials? What are you using to build this house that you have on the rock? I heard the story years ago that this, this very wealthy man was going to have this very nice house built. And he contracted with this contractor and said, man, I want you to use the finest materials. I want you to do this. I, I want this to be the best thing that you've ever built. Well, as the guy started building the, the house, he compromised a little. He cut a little on this corner. He, 
He didn't use the best. He used the second best here. And I mean, the place looked good, but he knew all the places that he had compromised and cut back. Well, this wealthy guy, when he saw the finished product, saw the finished house, he looked at it and said, man, this place is so beautiful. It's so wonderful. Uh, I just want to, instead of paying you for it, I'm just going to give it to you. And you can have it. Hmm. I don't want to build with faulty materials. I don't want to cut corners. I worked for a painting contractor one time that even when I was up on a 40-foot ladder, he said, I want the paint to be just as good up on top of a 40-foot ladder as it is down at the bottom where you can see it without getting, having to get up on anything. Because he wanted us to do things right and with integrity. In 1 Corinthians chapter 3, Paul writing to the church at Corinth, he talks to them about building you know, the, the materials that they, they use, right? It says in 1 Corinthians 3, beginning in verse 10, it says, according to God's grace that was given me, I have laid a foundation as a skilled master builder, and another builds on it. For each one is careful how he builds on it, for no one can lay another foundation than what, what's been laid. That foundation is Jesus Christ. Verse 12. If anyone builds on the foundation with gold, silver, costly stones, wood, hay, straw, each one's work will become obvious. For the day will disclose it because it will be revealed by fire. The fire will test the quality of each one's work. If anyone's work that he has built survives, he receives a reward. If anyone's work is burned up, he will experience loss, but he himself will be saved as through fire. Paul's writing to the church at Corinth and he's, he's talking about that next level of stuff. He's talking about what kind of evaluation or judgment that we'll have. And my question to you not only is, on what is your foundation built? What, do you have a solid foundation? What kind of materials are you using to build this house? The, the house of your life. Are you doing things that are self-sacrificing? Are you trying to meet the needs of people around you? Are you trying to do stuff that honors and glorifies Jesus? Some of us have no money and some of us have plenty. Are you using your plenty to further the kingdom of God? Uh, now, now I'm meddling, right? I talked about money. <laughs> he was preaching for a while, now he's meddling. Here's the question. Does your money do more than stuff just for you? I have in my office, I, I, uh, I took all my things to my office over there in Canton. I put up all my Florida State Seminole stuff in the name of Jesus. Oh, no takers, okay. At least it ain't a gator, alright? We can... Appreciate that. I put all the stuff in my office and I put three things over the door as I'm walking out with these three questions. Why? Why do I do what I'm doing? What? And then who does it benefit? I see it every time I look at the clock. I see it every time I'm getting ready to walk out the door. I, I have to ask those questions. What is my why? I want to do everything to please Jesus. Whether I'm here in the body or I'm absent, I'm present with the Lord. I make it my aim to be well-pleasing to Him. That's my why. What's the what? <laughs> Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. Love your neighbor as yourself. How about this? Do justly. Love mercy. Walk humbly with God. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways, acknowledge Him. And He'll direct your path. What's the what? The, the what is, I'm trying to live according to what God says. But the question that gets me all the time is who benefits? Am I doing this stuff just to benefit Rick? Can I let you in all those secrets? Yeah, I'm a selfish pig. Don't look at me like that because I know you guys are too. Don't we do stuff for our own comfort? Don't we do stuff for our own benefit? I mean, that's not terrible. I, I like taking care of me. But is your life set up on, taking, on doing something for somebody else besides yourself? This gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, stubble. That gold, silver, precious stones, what, what's precious to Jesus on your effort? Is, is taking care of orphans and widows in their distress and keeping oneself unspotted from the world. That is pure and undefiled religion. That's what James says. Uh, are, are you doing those, those things? I look at some of the time periods in my life and I did not build with good materials. I have to look at my stuff all the time and go, am I doing the right thing for the right reasons? 
when the storm comes and your house is blown, all the things that are worthless, it, it's going to go away. What, what are you doing? There's two bottles of water down here. I don't want to get the one that somebody else drank out of. In the name of Jesus. Yeah. Hey, I'm not meaning to be mean this morning. I'm putting up a mirror to my own life. And I want to ask the question because when the storm comes, not if, I've been through a lot of them. When the storm comes, I want to make sure my house is solid. <coughs> I want to make sure I am well taken care of. Uh, you probably heard the story of the, from that great theologian. It's called the three little pigs, right? And, and the first little pig builds his house out of what? Straw. You guys, come on. This is interactive now. Yeah, it builds out of straw. And what happens to it? The wolf comes and blows and house doesn't make it, right? The second pig comes along. I don't know if he's a smarter pig. I don't know how that works. He went to pig school. He built his house out of Sticks. This is a rough crowd this morning. All right. He built out of sticks. And the, the wolf came and blew and blew, and his house went down. That's two sets of bacon that, that that wolf had. He gets to the third one. I don't know if that guy, I don't know where he went to school, pig academy, something. He went and he built his house out of bricks. Now, if we can, if pigs can do this, we can do this. Ask yourself the question. In the past year, or since the beginning of the COVID, what have, you, what have you been building in your life? Many of us, self-protection. I'm not going to let that stuff in. I'm going to protect me and my family. Great. But in this time of loss and difficulty, have you really tried to serve the Lord by reaching and serving and doing for others? For a while, we're scared. For a while, we didn't know what to do. But I'm telling you, it doesn't matter if I'm in the middle of a storm. It doesn't matter if I'm in the middle of a, of a pandemic or whatever else. I'm going to do whatever it takes to be a blessing to the people around me in the name of Jesus. I don't know what the next thing's going to be. It's going to be something. Whether it's real or made up on TV, they're going to, it'll be something. Are you going to be marked as a person who's following Jesus? Are you going to be prepared by having a strong foundation? Are you going to build with quality materials? And the third one, are you going to have a watchful eye? A watchful eye. How, how does that go in there? Proverbs 22, verse 3 says, a prudent or a wise man sees trouble coming and prepares for it. That's why some of us put the jumper cables in the back of our car. That's why some of us had put money away for a rainy day. That's why some of us have started paying off all of our debts to make sure that we owe no one, right? We're, we're, we're trying to do it. We have a watchful eye. I don't know when something's going to happen. I don't know when something's going to come. But I am watching and careful to see. Am I worried? No. Okay, just a little. I mean, you, you had me. Okay, just a little bit. Don't you feel it in your gut? Don't you feel it just a little bit? That something's wrong and something's coming? If it doesn't, no big deal. My wife and I prepared for Y2K. Some of you aren't old enough to remember. That's the year 2000. And we stocked up on all these kind of things and we had pop -tart, enough Pop-Tarts till Jesus came. Right? Hallelujah. And ramen noodles. Whatever else. It came and went. You know what we, we had? We just had extra stuff. I don't know what's coming next in my personal life or in, my, in our culture. I, several months ago, I was evacuated from my position. Okay, I was fired. Uh, me and a whole bunch of other people. Saying evacuated makes it sound real pretty, but it wasn't. We, we just got to let go. And here's the thing. There were a bunch of us. I, I didn't know how we were going to make it. My wife and I keep, you know, we want to make sure we have food in the pantry. And we want to make sure we have some money here and there and whatever else. And we, we do the best we can. But in the midst of it, God took care of us. I don't know how we paid our bills. I don't know how we made it six months without a job. I'm not just telling you something that I read in the book. 
I'm telling you, my life is built on the foundation of Jesus. That so much so that there were people in my neighborhood, that one lady in our neighborhood said, hey, every, everybody's watching. Watching what? Everybody's watching to see what's going to happen to you because everybody knows that you lost your job. Do you realize people watch you? You may not know it. It might be your children. It might be your grandchildren. It might be the people down the street. People are watching you if you claim to be a Jesus follower. And if you don't, I mean, people watch you to see what you're going to do. My life was stirred and turned upside down. And you know what? I, it was tough. It was hard to walk through. But in the midst of the storm, we trusted Him. We had no alternative. I can look back and see how God's hand provided for us. We trusted Him and He took care of us. Did I have everything in the world? Well, no. But we had enough. What are some of the things, that, things you've seen in your life? Some of you, you've gone through loss. Betrayal. Some of you have been hurt by life circumstances. Some of you have lost jobs, children. You've been through a hard time. In the midst of your difficulty, where did you go? The statement is that the same sun that melts the wax hardens the clay. Which one were you? Was your heart softened to the things of God or did you just get angry and bitter? When life circumstances come at me, this is what I do. I'm prepared. I know where my trust lies. I am trying to build with good materials and I'm keeping a watchful eye when difficulties come. I'm prepared. Well, what about you? Are you prepared for what's next? On a physical side, if difficulties come to our culture, are you prepared? Do you have food, shelter, your bills paid? What about if difficulty comes to your personal life? Is your reliance and trust in Jesus, are you doing what He says? Because folks, we can put on a good show and we can put on a great game. We can put on the outside and everybody see that. But where is your heart? Jesus said this. He said, everyone who hears these words of mine, what's that? Chapter 5-7. through seven, All that stuff. And acts on them will be like the wise man who built his house on a rock. And the rain fell and the rivers rose and the winds blew and pounded the house. Yet it didn't collapse because its foundation was on the rock. But everyone who hears these words of mine and does not act, He'll be like the foolish man who built his house on the sand. The rain fell, the rivers rose, the winds blew and pounded the house, and it collapsed with a great crash. Here's my encouragement to you today. Where, where are you with Jesus? Have you come to a place that you have a relationship with the God of the universe through His Son, Jesus? Have you come to a place where you realize that Jesus is who He said He is, that He died on a cross, paid for your sin and mine, and He rose again on the third day. I don't understand how it works. I just know that it is. And have you been willing to put your faith, trust, and hope in Jesus to lead your life? And then, are you willing to do what He says? There might be some of you in this room, you know, hey, I, I made a decision to follow Jesus a long time ago, but I haven't done that stuff about doing what He says. Here's the cool thing with God. Anybody who will come He'll give you hope and life and peace and forgiveness because it was bought and paid for by Jesus Himself. Many of you in this room have probably made mistakes. You don't have to put your hand up. I don't want you to have to be accountable for that later. But I've made mistakes. I've dropped the ball. I haven't done this the whole time. And here's the thing for me. Jesus forgave me. He gave me grace. He restored me. And I'm able to walk into the future trusting Him. Can you think in your life right now? What are the areas in your life that aren't squared away? 
Do you have a relationship with Jesus? Are you doing what He says? And are you keeping an eye out for whatever's next and somebody who needs help and any of that kind of stuff? If you have not given your life to Jesus, I'm going to give you that opportunity today. Maybe you're sitting in here and you're stirred, you're a little uncomfortable, saying, okay, I get this, but what about me? Have you accepted Jesus as your Savior and made Him your boss? And if you have, are you doing what He says? Would you pray with me? I want everybody to bow your heads and close your eyes. You might be sitting here this morning and saying, you know what, I, I, don't, I don't know how to prepare for a storm. I've never asked Jesus to be my Savior. I've never made Jesus my boss. If you'd be willing on the inside while I say it out loud, you could say a prayer like this. Dear God, I know I've missed the mark. I know that in my past I've made mistakes and I have not put You first. God, I pray that You come into my life. You forgive me of my sin. You help me to follow You. God, I put my trust in Jesus. I believe that He lived a perfect life, paid for my sin, was buried in a tomb, and He rose again on the third day. Jesus is alive today. And God, I don't understand it, but I put my trust in You. And God, I'm asking You today to help me to follow You with all my heart. In Jesus' name I pray. Keep your heads bowed and your eyes closed. If that's You this morning, in just a minute, we're going to have a time of decision.